lately there's been a lot of YouTubers that have been targeted by some social engineering and some hackers to steal your channels, remonetize them, change their owners, steal from the people who love those channels and contribute to those channels, even in the form of live streaming and impersonating that person and stealing, I think it was, what, $15,000? This has become a lucrative type of theft. And don't, don't make any bones about it. This is theft. It's just theft through a different means and robbing people in a, in a very particular way. So, I've worked in IT for about 15 years, and I've seen quite a few things. I've survived the WannaCry virus and a few other things like that. I've watched companies make mistakes, watched companies actually pay ransoms for ransomware, only to be turned around and told to pay even more. So, I'm a little bit experienced in this. I won't say that I'm an expert, but I'll say that I'm a veteran of this particular kind of war. So, the first things that people need to look at is, during an email, is, is the email expected? If it's unexpected, it's already one in the negative column. You've got to be cautious about things like this. Also, look at the two I'm sorry, look at the from section. If it's some company that's saying, or someone who's saying that they're representing a company, you should expect to see a email domain that is the name of that company. If you just see it as a Gmail account or something like that, something's up. Most companies that have enough revenue to pay for advertisements with YouTubers have enough revenue to actually have a real email domain. Now, I'm not saying that's the end-all be-all, and that if you see a, a legitimate-looking email domain, that it's okay. People can set these up on their own anyways. It's just more difficult, and let's be honest, a lot of these hackers are lazy. If they weren't lazy, they wouldn't be stealing. So, moving on, you got to look at the two. If, uh, if it's been CC'd to you or carbon copied to you or blind carbon copied to you, that's also a red flag. Um, if you notice that there are a bunch of people in the two form, and, and it's like every one of these emails start with the same letter, like C or something like that, it's another red flag. Don't, don't. Dismiss it completely, but it's a balance between being wary and, and, and cautious and, and missing an opportunity. Um, if you don't know the sender uh, personally and they're not vouched for by someone that you trust, again, it's, that's a judgment call, but it is something to consider. Uh, let's see. The, the next thing to think about is hyperlinks. Um, hyperlinks are always present in all kinds of emails. I've even seen hacker hyperlinks in an unsubscribe button on something. And that's probably the most shocking one to me personally, that you know you think you could trust an unsubscribe button from what look something that looks like genuine spam. And that feels like an oxymoron saying that. But, you know, legitimate looking spam normally has an unsubscribe. Well, now hackers have figured out to embed whatever they're trying to hack you with into that unsubscribe button. And that's how they're going to get you. Um, if a link to a site is misspelled, where they replace the letter M with an RN, so that it visually kind of looks the same. And if you're not looking at it, then, yeah, 
if it's a domain, if it's an email or not an email, if it's a, if it's a URL that you've never heard of before or a company you've never heard of before, research the company. Um, if the hyperlink text and the actual hyperlink, when you hover over it and the mouse tooltip comes up, if those are two different things, that's another red flag. Um, if the date is really odd, like if I receive an email at, you know, 2 a.m. from a company in Japan, that's a little bit more within reason. But if I receive an email from Japan where it's 2, p 2 a.m. their time, that's that's a little unusual. I wouldn't I wouldn't trust that too much. That's another red flag. If the subject matter is either irrelevant or does not match the message content, it's another red flag. Um, if they can't address you by your name, it's another red flag. Hello, YouTuber is the one that's going out right now. Um, if the message is a reply, you know, sent to your email address and you never sent the initial email, it's another red flag. Attachments. Oh man, attachments are dangerous. The short of it, I don't trust attachments. I don't accept white papers at work anymore. We reject them out of hand completely. We just don't take them at all. I don't accept, excuse me for the phone, I don't accept PDFs. I don't accept pictures. I don't accept zip files. I don't accept anything. The only thing I would even consider accepting is a .txt file. And even then, I'm still a little wary of it. Uh, the content is a big thing. Um, this is where people try to motivate you. And let's just delve into the psychology of this a little bit. The motivations are, you know, pretty much fear of missing out. Fear in general. Anger, because if they do something that makes you angry, you know, you're not thinking as much. Uh, a limited time stamp on it, where it's like, oh, well, you only have 10 minutes to, to reply to this. It's like, no. What business is really going to give you a time limit like that? Uh, the possibility of gaining something of value. Everyone likes to get free stuff, but is it really free, and are you really getting it? Um, another thing they like to do is get you really excited about something. And, uh, I mean, it, it, this is all just amplifying any emotion that they figure out that they can amplify inside of you to get you to not think. And the biggest thing they want you to do is to take an action. If you take an action, they've, they've got you. If you download that thing, if you open that packet, if you open, if you click that hyperlink, they've got you because you took the action. All they're doing is putting a mousetrap in front of you and they can't force you to step on it. Um, I'm going to move on to like some of the other stuff and move some of my notes. You know, I'm, I'm really just doing this for the community as much as I can. So we're going to move on to passwords. Never give out your password to anyone. Don't give it out to your friends. Don't give it out to your family. Not even your really good friends. Honestly, people make mistakes. And the more people that know something, the more likely it's going to accidentally be shared. Same as with your password. So if I only know my password... There's a 10, like, let's just say there's a 10% chance. If 10 people know my password, now we're multiplying that chance by 10. That means eventually it's guaranteed that my password is going to get out there. Don't use, next up is don't use the same password over and over again. I know that everyone's got their favorite, and I was guilty of this in the past. But Try to create passwords individually for each site. Um, you know, try to create something that is nice and lengthy and you know, does not 
make sense to anyone except you. You can even use a sentence and shorthand it down. Like, uh, I was born in 1974. That's actually a lie, but, you know, so it's uh, I W B. And I can actually change the I to a one, which is the next thing is using so, is uh, changing letters for numbers back and forth. So, you know, one W B seven four exclamation point exclamation point or you know just just anything like that. Um, always make your passwords at least eight characters long. The longer the better, because uh, then they won't be able to brute force it. Brute forcing is where they just basically keep flinging passwords, uh, random entries in at a password to try to crack it. Uh, don't use dictionary words. Um, if it's in the dictionary, chances someone's actually going to guess it. Uh, you know, um, don't post it in plain sight. You know, I mean, if you've got to write it down, write it down on something like an index card and put it in an envelope and tape that envelope to like the bottom of a desk or something, something outside of camera's view or everything. Uh, that way, if you're streaming or anything like that or making a video, that the password doesn't accidentally get out and get, you know, photographed without you knowing or anything like that. Um, see, these are, guys, these are all phishing attacks. Any of these links and stuff in that email that I was mentioning earlier, these are phishing attacks. And they're really dangerous, and they can take everything away. And you can, and I've said this in the past, that we really should have two-factor authentication on your Google account, which is linked to your YouTube account and stuff like that. But I did not realize how how easy it is to actually disengage that two-factor authentication. I'm really hoping that Google will up their game on this quite a bit and actually allow people to use things like the algorithm YouTube, I mean, uh, Google Authenticator for us so that we can actually secure our channels even more. Um, oh, make sure all of your devices are secure. This means that it's not okay for you to actually go to an internet cafe and log into your YouTube channel because you don't know anything about that device at all. There could be a key logger plugged into the back of it and suddenly everything's gone. But um, these are just some of the tips that I would love to share with the community as much as I can. I'm very sorry that this has happened to any and all of you that are out there on YouTube that are currently fighting your fight, try to get your channels back, especially the people that have been sold or stolen. Um, it's horrible. I know that it feels like you've been violated, and I hope that this helps at least someone out there.